want to thank everybody for listening. And, um, you know, this, uh, this week. Keep going. Sorry. Oh, my Lord. The... I just didn't. Why did I do? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> did I just Bro break everything? You just broke right in. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh my ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> uh, you're not going to believe who's ladies, here. Ladies and gentlemen, I didn't even know this guy, but apparently someone who looks like Andrew Yang just burst in on this phone call. Andrew Yang, everybody, just want to say this is exactly how we rehearsed it. So just want to say salute and we may do this again. We may not. We may just keep it in. I think. Oh, we should definitely keep it in. Yeah. Oh. This is. I, I just like how Andrew Yang can break into any Skype call he wants. Yes, yeah. te technology. I'm like the Kool Aid Man of Skype call. <laughs> I just bust out in and be like, "Oh yeah." <laughs> is this how you burst in on Rogan's podcast? You just get <laughs> like, like, like I don't know. Rogan had on Bernie Sanders, and you just walked in. Hey guys. Can we talk? Like, how'd you how'd you get in here? Well, I, just, I can do what I want. <laughs> I would love to have somehow photobombed that particular <laughs> okay. podcast. For those, of you just, for those of you just listening right now, Andrew Yang uh, just appeared on our FaceTime on our call right now. We have as our special guest Andrew Yang on the darkest timeline. So I can't. Yeah. Words can't express. Andrew, right now. thank you for uh, hurting your career by coming on our <laughs> second episode. And I like that we are such jabronis. Um, we don't know how to bring up Andrew Yang ourselves. And Andrew Hobson, our producer, is like, hey, me and Joe are rambling so long. And uh, Andrew said, remember to bring up Andrew Yang. And then Andrew Yang just like, just fucking. He appeared. Up. Oh I like that. that. I like a guest that just break. So... I love that. It's perfect. So, Andrew Yang, you are, uh, thank God that you're here on this planet and you're an American here in our country at this crazy time. Uh, I think a lot of people tuning in thinking it's going to be a community watchback podcast, but uh, now we have uh, international uh, politicians, uh, people who ran for president, and Andrew Yang, who might single handedly save our economy. Is that right? Possibly. Can you please, please? I would love to be a part of the solution. Certainly, this pandemic has accelerated many of the trends that I've been concerned about for years. Uh, and it's highlighting the need to put money directly into people's hands. Right now, it's a necessity for families to stay afloat. But it's going to continue to be a necessity because the dark truth is that our economy is not going to snap back to what it was uh, after this virus clears. That's just not the way organizations work. It's not the way consumer confidence works. There are many, many people right now that are unfortunately battening down the hatches and preparing for uh, a really rough period. And I, I think that's unfortunately the right approach. Yeah. Andrew, you can see. Uh, Go ahead, Ken. Andrew and I are, are friends and I endorsed him during his uh, pre historic presidential run. And it was an honor to um, endorse you because you are the first Asian American Democratic candidate in presidential history to run for president. And it was just, uh, it was such an honor. And Andrew. That's not why, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> wait, are you, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, time out. Are you, are you blaming me? Are you blaming me? Like I somehow like ended your campaign because once I said it, then you're like, okay, campaign no, suspended. I'm, I'm just, it wasn't because of the Asian thing. It was because of uh, a fundamental connection to my platform. Uh, because I know, I know, Ken, uh, you know, you would never just, just climb onto a campaign because of, uh, of yeah. the Asian thing. No, no. Actually, <laughs> oh, I don't think he, I'm, I think you're underestimating Ken. I don't think, I think he agrees with you about anything politically. How dare you? But... Just because I wanted to get Donald Glover's phone number? How dare you? So <laughs> what I want... <laughs> I forgot his number when we saw him in November. But no, what, what, I, what I you were <laughs> what I what I my 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 big thing. It was funny. Um, Andrew and I talked over the Christmas holidays, and um, and it was it was fun. Like I I did not want to endorse any anyone without having just a consensus with my family, with my wife. And so you and I and my wife Tran, we got on a phone call, and we really 
we re- I mean, Trent did a, a very thorough job just kind of talking policy, talking, you know, I- exactly what UBI, universal basic income, is all about, talked about health care. We talked about so many issues for an hour, and, and I, I was thinking the whole time, both my wife and I were, we were just so stunned at how much time you took to talk to us and how patient you are with us, because if anything, we, we asked you a lot of challenging questions, and uh, we were really... Uh, we we're really just stuck with how struck by how sincere sincere you are and how authentic you are and and just um it's it's really just an honor man it really is dude and i and i and we've talked so many times since it's just it's just cool that you know it's just cool i can call you my friend now man it's just it's just great well thanks ken i mean uh, i appreciate you and tran digging in uh and joel to to your point i mean uh we have to start trying to prepare to rebuild our country for when this virus does clear, uh, because it's going to need a lot of help. Uh, You know, things are not going to knit themselves back together. We're going to be dealing with the scars of this for quite some time. And the question is just how uh, deep those scars run, Uh, because you can see it in some of the trends that are coming out of China and the countries that experienced the virus early on, but you see elevated divorce rates. You saw elevated levels of uh, child abuse and domestic violence. I mean, uh, we're we're putting a very benign face on people being at home, but the fact is if you're trapped at home for weeks or even months on end, uh, some harm develops. uh, And, you know, it's compounding over time. Uh, our, Our economy in particular, uh, I've run organizations, and the, the fact is when there's a recession, a lot of organizations make decisions that they've been putting off for a while. Um, they're not going to hire back all of these people. I mean, uh, if you look at it, I think Macy's just said they were furloughing the majority of their 125,000 employees. There were a lot of those employees that were on the brink anyway. Uh, and then when they make the decision to furlough 125,000, they're not going to bring back 125,000. Um, after the store is reopened because they're going to expect a diminished level of business. Um, So these changes are going to be with us for a long time. I I wish I had better news to report, uh, but we have to start getting value into people's hands and rethink how our economy works very, very quickly. I mean, you were were the first one to, you know, bring up universal basic income, um, you know, last year. And so it was very interesting to me when... um, the White House administration brought that up as a possibility. Mitt Romney brought that up as a possibility. And I, and, and then when that was announced publicly, I texted you. And I just texted you three words. You were right. And, uh, and it was – I, I think you – what I love about you is that you are a visionary and you are in many ways ahead of your time. But you – talking to you on a deeper level – you're also a realist, and it's very hard, um, especially in the Democratic Party, to kind of merge those elements of, you know, you know, maybe having some more moderate fundamentals with progressive fundamentals. It's like almost an impossible marriage, but somehow you pulled it off, and I, you know, I, I really feel that um, that's why you connected with so many people, and that's why you transcended party lines. I, it was astonishing to see how many people across the board just gravitated towards you. And I think also you weren't negative at all. You weren't, you you were nothing but, but but positive, you know? And I I felt like you were, I think that's the forward thinking that um, a lot of people, myself included, you know, it's hard not to be negative. And how was it, how was it on the campaign trail just being, keeping up with your humanity forward philosophy? I mean, I, th- I feel like you're the only candidate in either party to do that. I, I, I still don't know how you kept that up. You know, Ken, what's funny is uh, on the trail, when you interact with everyday Americans in Iowa, New Hampshire, or Ohio, wherever it is, it's actually pretty easy. It's like most people that come out to see you are just interested in improving their lives and, and uh, trying to make things better for their family. It actually got tougher when you dealt with uh the dynamics of the race where I, I have to be honest, like that there were folks who told me it's like, Hey, you know, like, like uh, throw some rocks at people <laughs> like various times because they thought that would gin up attention um, because the, the press is more likely to cover conflict. It's one reason why you saw on the debate stage, some of the lower polling candidates, it always seemed like they, they tried to engage in some kind of uh, death grip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. And, and I saw there was some logic to that, but I was like, you know, if I did that, one, it's not my my uh, my natural um, tendency, and, and two, people are going to see right through it. <laughs> it's going to seem just like another obvious political move, uh, and I in particular would be terrible at it. So, uh, you know, like, it was easier on the trail, Ken, than it was uh, in terms of debates in other parts of the race. Yeah, I, I find uh, on my own on my own lower level, I feel I feel the same way. It's easier for me to be positive, you know, when I'm um, meeting my fans and, and and meeting my friends, and then and then there's certain right. people along the and then again there's certain people along the trail, the podcast trail, and you're looking at mm-hmm. them right now that um, it's kind of hard not to be negative with when you're with such a well, deep soul that is so devoid of Ken, when humanity. When, when your career gets going, beard, people are gonna really love. I hate everything. You stand no, I mean, think you Don't got famous me by showing your of penis at Yang. jumping out of a car, and I think that's a big great. deal to me. And, and stop could overlapping I, me, not in overlapping front of you, Andrew at all. Yang. You sound like a desperate stop, candidate, Ken, top, who is talking attacking. like this in front. I can't of believe the great Andrew, Andrew Yang, Yang has to deal with. To this, do you this think if we could get the economy started by this, hiring yeah, an interior this, designer yeah, for Ken? Uh, you know, it looks like he broke into a hotel in 1989. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, but Andrew, uh, I wanted to ask you, so what is your day like? Do your days like these days? Do you, so do you wear, you obviously wear a sport coat around the house, which is very cool. Again, just waist up. You know, I've got uh, gym shorts on. <laughs> He's got billabong shorts uh, right underneath. But, <laughs> but to do what you're doing, which is trying to fix, you know, try work out this economy for, for in this crazy time. So do, how does your, what does your day look like? You know, it, it is frustrating. And I feel for um, folks like Joe Biden, who's, you know, like, the presumptive nominee and he's trapped in his house just like the rest of us uh yeah. and uh, and the, you and ken joel are kind of professional entertainers and so if you just stick a camera on you you can like make it work um Thank that's not the case for, that's not the case for most uh political <laughs> figures honestly like you can't just like stick a camera up and be like go um uh, and so it, it's it's harder for um, public officials who are trying to to do positive things. For me personally, right now, I'm maybe busier than ever, uh, and a lot of the work that I'm doing can be done from afar or or virtually. Um, so the thing I'm I'm proudest of right now is that uh, we've uh, raised 1.25 million dollars and given away about 1.1 million of it to needy families wow. around the country through my organization, Humanity Forward. Um, so if, if you're listening to this and you need a micro grant of 250 to 500 dollars, you can go to movehumanityforward.com and no promises because demand is far outstripping our ability to meet it, but we'll do our best. And if you're uh, able to to donate, um, you can do the same, and every dollar will go to someone who's in need right now. So that's keeping me busy. Uh, I'm launching a podcast. Uh, it sounds very original, but you know I have to say it was it was in the works. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I've got. Is it uh, a rewatch of Family Ties? <laughs> I did like. Hey, that I'd show, watch but... that. I'd listen to that. Andrew Yang, you know, he he, go, he does a Mallory rewatch. That's that's what I want. I will. Really, oh. I would love Andrew. You'd be yeah. like, well, this is where Mallory got her boyfriend Nick. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and Nick I goes, love this. Hey, Mr. Keaton, day. I would. I would love that. I was a big Justine Bateman fan. You remember that movie she was in? Uh, I think it was called Satisfaction. Yes, I uh, do. I do yeah. that era, if you haven't seen it, it's a classic uh, of the era. Uh, so, so you know I, what? We're talking uh, about the important issues, man. The economy, Justine Bateman, Satisfaction. These are think, important issues that people... I all the bullet points. I really do. Yeah. I, really I can't do. believe you're doing a podcast about this. Thanks for coming on, Andrew Yang. Bye. No. <laughs> Uh, uh, but I'm, 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 I'm working on um, a project to try and uh, activate people's uh, consumer data rights. Uh, so that's very exciting because right now people don't know what's going on with our data and it's getting sold and resold over and over again. And there may be a way to actually get money into people's hands. I'm all about putting money into people's hands, um, as you know. So, uh, so this may be a way to do that. I'm really excited about. Uh, I'm obviously doing some work for CNN um, from home. Uh, and I'm working on something right now that uh, I'm going to try and rope um, you both into, but it's called the All-American Campaign. It's around trying to 
uh, call out the fact that we're all American. And right now there are many Asians who are bearing the brunt of uh, coronavirus based uh, racism and hostility uh, because, you know, people uh, blame China for the, the rise of the virus. And obviously there's some truth to the fact that Chinese government um, screwed us all. Uh, but that has very little to do with Chinese Americans or Korean Americans <laughs> or right. other people that are living their lives here. Um, so uh, we're working on a campaign to try and uh, call out the fact that we're all American and that um, we all need to uh, stay together and pull uh, pull each other up. Uh, and certainly many uh, of my friends in the Asian American community are donating time, resources, uh, money, like trying to buy masks for uh, communities in, in need. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm working on that. I'm busier than ever. Um, and it's a very strange feeling because, you know, when you're trapped at home, um, like the, the thought is like, well, maybe I'll just kick it, uh, kick it with my family for a little while. But like, I, I certainly, um, feel a, a real responsibility to try and help the country through this time because it's such a painful time. I mean, the, uh, the, the gaslighting of, you know, crazy. I'll just say it, the gaslighting and calling it Chinese virus just has sickened me from the get-go where I literally have to bite my tongue. It is just so transparent to me. It is racist, it's sickening, and it affects all of us. It, you, you do not do that, and for and you and I, Andrew, we've talked about it, you know, um, off the record, and, and I'm just, just so happy that you're doing something about it and galvanizing the Asian Absolutely. American community. Uh, to fight this because we're all affected. We're all affected yep. and not just Asian American. We're just, this is affecting us as a country. This is not, this is not what we stand for right now. This is, nope. this is, you know, this is a global problem. This is a global pandemic. And as a physician, you know, when you're seeing all of these cases in this country right now, and we are rising up that steep slope of that curve that we're trying to flatten through social distancing, you know, as we're talking right now, you know, estimates are growing of the death rate, and that affects all of us. And I know we all know somebody uh, that has been affected with coronavirus, yeah. and it is to a point right now where we just got to stop gaslighting people. It's stupid. It's not helping. It's racist, and it's insulting to our intelligence as a nation. And yeah. I am, uh, you know— Ken, I, did I, really I tell think, you— I yeah, I went into I went into an urgent care two weeks ago, right before it got bad. I don't know if you can see. I cut my head open uh, while I was headbutting Ken. And oh, that's uh, right. that's no, right. but I went to this urgent care and I said, "How many people?" This is right at the beginning, and I said, "How many people are calling in?" They're like, "We can't put the phone down." And then I said, "How many people are blaming Corona beer?" And as a joke, they said, "You wouldn't believe how many people are saying they're not drinking." And then voluntarily, they said numerous people have said, "Oh, and we're not going to Chinese restaurants." And I just thought, "You got how ignorant? It's how ridiculous. it's ridiculous. just incredible that." Uh, and and yes, and obviously, the White House needs to be the first to uh, lead the uh, in education. And so it's yeah, it's a mess. Yeah, and and that's what I loved about Andrew. Like you. You put your country over your party, and you even publicly just applauded anyone who, who like gravitated towards your principles and ideals. You know, including the Trump administration, including Mitt Romney. Like you, what I what I like about you is that you gave credit where credit is due. You weren't you you weren't making it a political issue. You're not even in the race anymore, and then you're just applauding people for you know to, and 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 willing to willing to help out in any way you can and that's what everyone in this country needs to do is follow your lead and just cross party lines and just i i don't know and 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 just move forward together and um and that you inspire me you know on on, on that level yeah yeah, yeah the, the the only silver lining that could come out of this uh time is if we do things differently on the way out like if we come together if we have different kinds of solutions, like putting money directly into people's hands, which, uh, as you, you guys know, I've been um, passionate about as like the best way to act, help people solve their problems and improve our lives. Uh, that's my hope for this, is that this is a terrible time. Like, it, it's almost impossible to even try and find a silver lining in it. Uh, it's so destructive and devastating on so many levels. Uh, but the hope I have is that if we come out of this willing to do things differently, willing to come together uh, across party lines, then maybe we can do things that actually 
uh, help move the country forward on the, 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 the way out of this crisis. Yeah. I mean, and, um, and, yeah. and, yeah. No, 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 go ahead, please. No, why do you hate math so much? No, no, he likes it. That's what he, oh! that's why it's on the thing. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I was got to get screwed. But does it look backwards? Because I'm like, <laughs> you know, what's, what's funny is it really was like, uh, um, a supporter who uh, came up with the acronym Make America Think Harder. Um, a lot of the campaign was very organic uh, and grassroots that way. Um, but, you know, math uh, math started out as sort of a, like a um, uh, humorous aside in the campaign, but it actually embodied the fact that math is nonpartisan, like the facts don't lie, numbers don't lie, you can't wish them away, uh, and you can't wish this virus away. You know, like the, this... Um, this country, unfortunately, has gotten trapped in this two-party duopoly where you have like these two alternate versions of reality that are competing. And then there's this objective version of reality that, <laughs> like, actually, I just out the window. Uh, and uh, it doesn't serve any of us well if uh, you have these two sides that are essentially will um, try and negate whatever the other, other side is doing. I have to ask you on a lighter note, why... Why the no tie? You know, like on every debate state, what was your thinking behind it? You know, not wearing a tie um, to anything. Uh, I will uh, happily lighten up, Ken. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, like, I don't want to, um, you know, be um, be adding to uh, to what people are feeling. No, it was interesting. The first debate came up on the schedule. I hadn't been wearing a tie on the campaign trail, and so I said to the team, "It's like, hey, am I wearing a tie to this thing?" And so the first thing we did is we looked at the rule book. And the funny thing about the de debate rule book is there's absolutely no dress code. So in theory, I could have worn, uh, you know, like a, in like a an ape costume or like whatever the heck. Like there was no actual rule around it. Like a who farted so, T-shirt. Yeah, yeah. So we 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 had one, that would have a, been outstanding yeah. if you had decided to dress up as an ape wearing a who farted T-shirt. That's or, hey, that's a humble pitch, Andrew. Next time, next 2024. Yes, we had yeah. a number of jokes. But I could go with that t-shirt and blazer look and the t-shirts could be like an advertisement for something and then every commercial break i would change t-shirt it'd be a different color and a different message <laughs> yeah. oh. so we, had, we had all sorts of uh thoughts around it um but you know like the the team looked at it and said well look if you haven't been wearing a tie this whole time on the trail uh like do you really want to put one on for the debate and I was like, well, let's just show up without without a tie, and, and like it, it'll stamp me as a non politician. Um, I genuinely don't like ties because I had to wear one uh, a lot as a teenager. I went to this boarding school that had a dress code, and so I had like this long time aversion to them because as a teenager I was you know like stuck wearing them um, a lot. It was yeah. like a dead poet society type school. Ken so, also doesn't uh, hates wearing ties because he still doesn't know how to tie them and. No, uh, it's not. Neck, hey, whoa, whoa! It's not. It's not, it's not about. It, it's more. It, it's it's more of a jowl issue than like an inability to tie. But go on, Andrew. No, please. I would say that that's also an issue. Go ahead. Go sorry, ahead. Andrew. Please, sorry, Andrew. Not, uh, Enough about no, my chins. I have to say, community alums. I mean, you all have done such cool stuff. I feel like most of us, uh, right, Joe? Like hmm. the breaking ground for, uh, <laughs> for people who've had outstanding uh, careers. I mean, you two and Donald and everyone else. Um, it must be fun. Like, do you guys ever have de facto reunions? We have. We have. We had one go ahead, we, uh, that we referenced uh, on the last podcast back in November. We had uh, we had a reunion in, in L.A. and um, Joel uh, organized a dinner afterwards and brought everyone to his favorite steakhouse. And Dan Harmon, the creator, the whole cast of community was there. And Joel brought Donald Glover to the dinner, and we a lot of us hadn't seen him in a while, and it was. Uh, the best night ever, and um, I, I I wouldn't know because I blacked out. But anyway, it's not it's not beside the point. Andrew Yang is beside the point. So, mm. but it was it, we had such a great time, and um, we, no, we're, we're, to say that we and are we're on a, a we're on a text we're, we're all on a text together. Yeah, where I mean, right up to the very moment when we started taping this podcast, we were texting because uh, and now community is now on Netflix, and so all this press just came out, and we were all making fun of it, and uh, so yeah, no, we are we. It's great that we all still like each other, and and we look back on that time as as a as a, a magical time that had a lot of hours. Well, the viewership is about to multiply because literally everyone's stuck at home, and Community is now on Netflix. Oh my gosh! Like uh, literally, I think 
five to ten times more people are going to watch it over this. I mean, I have to say it was successful in its time. Mm, but that, uh, everyone always, know, yeah, no, everyone always said the ratings were terrible. And then I would always look at the ratings. I'd be like, they're pretty good. And we're up against Big Bang Theory. So what's going on? And uh, yeah. I don't have a chip on my shoulder about that at all. Yeah, Joel, stop complaining to Andrew Yang about the 2011 ratings, all right? Just stop it. Andrew Yang doesn't but want to I hear it. He but is let, a man. Of, go ahead, Andrew. Let's talk Sorry, more about yeah. Justine Bateman, Joel. Now think about this. Like, literally 100% of Americans are, like, at home. I mean, not 100. You'd probably say, like, 95. They're probably 5% <laughs> that are. Or actually, more than that, if you include. Anyway, so let's call it, like, 90% of Americans are at home. Uh, and then of them, you figure half of them uh, have Netflix or have access to someone else's Netflix password. <laughs> so you're looking yeah. at, so yeah, I mean, you're you're looking at tens of millions of Americans watching you all in your prime, uh, you know, at your comedic heights or not your heights because you're probably funny. Yeah, no, that was you... Ken's fine. I think that was, <laughs> it, that was the best that Ken could do easily. I think we would all agree on that. I, I unfortunately agree too, but moving on. And Donald, his career yeah. just tanked afterwards. Yeah, yeah. And exactly. you guys were definitely him. carrying Donald around. That, that that's clear. Boom. We're gonna grab that. <laughs> we're gonna grab that sound bite, and that's all we're gonna record. That's all we're gonna display. We Bullshit. carried Donald. That came from Andrew Yang. So um, that's amazing. Yeah, we're gonna see a lot of royalties from those Netflix shows. <laughs> oh, oh wait, that's right. We won't see anything. These are the complaints that I have. Wait, Andrew, I got a question for you. Uh, to, to, I'm turning it serious again. I read a uh, uh, a thing going like questioning how food supplies are going to uh, what what's going to happen with food supplies in the next couple months and and question and there was a lot of questions like would they are they going to, are they going to stop or and I wasn't sure if it was uh, just a way to scare everyone or we should truly be worried about the food supply chain. From what I've seen, um, production is still continuing. Like everyone in that sector is considered essential. Uh, and then the processing is continuing. The transportation it, to grocers is continuing. I haven't seen anything that leads me to, to think that, um, that any, any of that is being impacted because everyone in that industry is considered essential. Now, you're, you are seeing a couple of um, like strikes at Whole Foods and things on the front end, um, but that's in the scheme of what we're talking about, um, relatively marginal. I would be concerned if food producer um, uh, companies and packers and uh, truckers and uh, like if I saw strikes in those sectors, uh, that would be like a, a huge danger sign. But I haven't seen anything yeah. like that. Uh, I certainly sympathize for the Whole Foods workers because, uh, you know, literally all of their friends and neighbors are being told to stay at home uh, for their health. And then they are continuing to, to go to work and they're in very public facing environments where they could plausibly say it's like you know what i interacted with dozens of people um today like some of them were definitely within breathing range <laughs> you know that, like i'm like not getting exactly paid hazard yeah uh, hazard duty pay and so the the fact that they're uh striking or protesting makes perfect sense to me um but i, I haven't seen anything that suggests our, our food supply is uh, uh is uh endangered in that way what do you think of the run on toilet paper well, I mean, I, I tweeted something that, that said, like, in theory, we'd be using the same amount of toilet paper as we ever did. <laughs> you know, like, it's not like all of a sudden, like, you know, you need like twice the the volume. Uh, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. Um, certainly when I saw an empty toilet paper shelf, it got me thinking that if I did see toilet paper, I'd buy an awful lot. Right. Uh, I think some of it really is just like crowd behavior, where as soon as you think something is going to be scarce, and it wasn't just toilet paper. It's like I, when I was going around the grocery store, I think eggs were scarce. Um, yeah. The, the one trip I went, and then I was like, I got to find some eggs. <laughs> like as soon as you, and then the next time I went, uh, then there were plenty of eggs. So you know, there, there's probably just some randomness um, to when uh, each grocery store gets supply. Um, but I think toilet paper kind of just end up feeding on itself as a thing because we all started seeing that there were shortages. And then if you did see some, then you bought it, um, uh, a lot of it, and probably made the shortage worse. Yeah. I mean, uh, on a, can't use a lot a, of toilet paper. <laughs> go ahead. On a, you can on, see the entire bedroom is made out of it. So go ahead. Welcome to my Cottonelle bed. But what I, <laughs> but it's um, I have an endorsement with him. Whatever, Joel. Um, oh, it's zero. Go ahead, North. Uh, <laughs> 
what 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 really what really um, whenever I think about you is you know knowledge is power and facts matter science matters um, and and I, I think right now is proof positive that we can't deny the science and it's all up to us to keep updated um, for me and my wife's a physician as well it's so important that and I, I preach this all the time on the podcast and on social media. Um, I think the best source for me is cdc.gov. Uh, their COVID-19 it, 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 sites are updated continually, and it's evolved, and it's always an evolution. And I think really the best way to get behind all this is knowledge. And I think that's what you have been preaching all along is knowledge is power, and we got to stay informed, and we got to stay updated. And stop living in denial stop being you know part of that kubler roth death stage of just you know denial right up front and whereas some people in power are and were and now that's evolving and i think that's really we have to get together and accept this reality and then get the brightest minds to a get new fda you know fda has approved emergency uh use of hydroxychloroquine and I get that, and there's some promising studies like Cedar sinai has um, remdesivir, which is this amazing antiviral that's shown promise uh, for SARS and MERS, and they're doing that at Cedar sinai right now. It's just really the best way to fix the economy is the medicine, is the science, to get randomized controlled trials that will lead to FDA-approved drugs, and also, you know, and also, you know, getting fast tracking a vaccine. And well, the, the promising yeah. thing is that. I, uh, what I've read is that the virus is, is, is not mutating, and, um, and that's good from a vaccine perspective. You can make you – know, many, many scientists have already sequenced the genome for the coronavirus, for COVID-19, and you can replicate that synthetically to build antibodies against. And so I think there's a lot of – promising therapies out there but we can't have disinformation we can't have people just talking on the air negating what someone else just said publicly that it's just ridiculous and that's going if that's confusing me as a former physician i can only think of how that's confusing the whole public and i I really think we have to get on the same page accept the science and move forward yeah Yeah, the, the best way to fix the economy is to get the virus under control there really is no other way uh, it, because if, if you have the virus continue to recur in waves and you have to have multiple shutdowns and the rest of it, um, it it's going to make it impossible to have consumers uh, feel confident about making purchases, about businesses making investments. It, like the virus is the the answer. Like you know, it's the cause of the problem and it's the cure uh, in terms of how we're going to get our economy uh, actually moving in the right direction again. Anyone who thinks we're going to reopen things while we're dealing with the virus. Um, uh, to me, is is wrongheaded. Yeah, wow. and, yeah and th- but there will. I mean, there's going to be a vaccine. Obviously, I mean, th- there's it, there is the end game here is that Matter there will time, be one. Just the question is when. But yeah, there will be a vaccine. It will uh, be um, it will be effective in uh, the vast vast majority of cases. The, really, the question is how long it takes us to get there, what happens between now and then. I mean, the, the long, and like whether the distribution, it's, uh, you know, whether um, its effectiveness is uh, where it needs to be. Um, so there are some risks with you t- kind of take a vaccine that maybe um, hasn't been vetted as thoroughly or um, isn't as effective. Uh, and then we try and distribute it maybe sooner than, than it it's, uh, is optimal. I mean, the longest time frames I've seen are in like the, and this is actually not even long. This is actually pretty fast. And Ken might have better information than me on this. It's like an 18 month time frame is like, uh, yeah. is, is what people. Yeah. That, 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 that's what they say is an 18 month time frame at the earliest. And it's, it's, um, I, I was, I was explaining to a friend of mine, um, who is a, a director in terms of uh, in movies like how, how this works. It, it really is just kind of, you have to like in building a script, you, 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 you have to write a rough draft. You have to write an outline. You have to write a story document. There's so many levels to getting, let's say, a polished script, you know, ready for, you know, ready to shoot. And there's at least, you know, 20 thorough vettings that are going on internally. And it's the same way and then some in medicine because you have to make sure, A, that it's safe because as a physician, 
do no harm, whether it's a medication, whether it's a vaccine. And then you have to test its efficacy to like to see if it works and how well does it work. And then you have to combine all those things and to see how it can be mass distributed. And I think that's what makes hydroxychloroquine so attractive. It's so funny. Even I would have debates with my wife about it. My wife still practices. And I read that French study that all the you know that all the hydroxychloroquine rage was about and i was like that makes sense if it's if it's like you have a you have a study of like maybe i don't know a half dozen people that were on hydroxychloroquine half that were not and this was and then the the hydroxychloroquine study they showed that they all had improvement what sanjay gupta on cnn accurately pointed out six people dropped out of that study one person died some of those people couldn't even handle the medication so if you look at the, it's too small a sample size to say that's effective. Does it show potential? As Deborah Burke said, yes, it shows potential. It shows promise, but we need a larger control trial. And and, and those studies are undergoing right now. And not to mention yep. that they're uh, and with the vaccine. There's a tri- there's a trial in Seattle that I love that is you know that I saw on MSNBC someone being interviewed. And it, to me, that even that has that vaccine trial takes weeks. To like figure if that even if that even works. So if that takes weeks on a small like half dozen people enrolled in a vaccine trial locally, think about it on a national scale. It's going to take it could take years. Yeah. Well, one thing we would definitely need is a faster way to say hydroxychloroquine. Um, you know, we'd have to call it the Drox or something like that. Oh, It'd be a... <laughs> that's what we that's what we need to trademark. You, Wait. me, and Joel. We just call the Drox. It. Sounds good. Yeah. Can you? Can you smell what the Drox is cooking? Maybe you have a T-shirt that does that. You know, mm, I feel like you can put that on your ape suit in 2024. Just a thought. You don't have to say yes. Fine. All right. All right. He just <laughs> said he said yes. I think that was a yes. <laughs> then maybe maybe they'll see this podcast. And they'll change the rules for the 2024 debates. They'll be like, oh, <laughs> we might want to put in some dress code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. You know, um, the DNC is bumping on the ape suit, and then you're like. <laughs> And you're like, well, Ken suggested it. And they're like, yeah, we know. So let's just not do that anymore. But, Andrew, I, I just want to thank you for <laughs> taking uh, just taking the time to come to talk to us. And, um, you know, thank you for continuing to inspire us. And, you know, please um, please follow Andrew Yang on social media. And, and, and what he's doing right now, I, I say, is even more significant because – Right now, he is making a difference on all levels and on all platforms and of all races. And I just, I just want to thank you for just sharing your time and energies with us. And much love to Evelyn and your beautiful family. And uh, just, just thank you. Hopefully, we can reconvene under better circumstances and in person. And, um, and, and, and then, you know, we can talk together without Joel. Well, uh, I'm, well no. I think he was excited to come on the podcast because of me, because uh, he loved the great indoors, even though in one season. Uh, but Andrew, what's the name of the? When does the podcast start? Um, the podcast will be launching in the first week of May. We think it's called Yang Speaks, okay. uh, and we're really excited about it. Uh, Joel would love to have you on. I know Ken's gonna, going to be on uh, sometime early on. Uh, Van Jones, Crystal Ball, uh, Albert Wenger, who's like a futurist who's uh, who's putting money up for a universal basic income trial. Um, so that there are a lot of really exciting things that we can do. I ran oh. for president because I, I had a vision of both the problems and solutions. And one thing I'll say is that we can actually start working on some of these solutions independent of government. I mean, uh, certainly, I think government has to play a huge role in solving some of the biggest problems of our time. That's why I ran. Uh, but I'm an action-oriented person. I'm certainly not just going to wait around. Uh, and there are things that we can do to improve our own lives uh, and start solving these problems right now. Really appreciate uh, you both. And uh, What's the charity you know, again, Andrew? The charity is Humanity Forward. Uh, and every dollar that gets donated to our coronavirus relief fund gets given to uh, an American family in need. Very Again, good. we're up to 1.25 million. Um, and if anyone wants to donate, uh, please do go to movehumanityforward.com. Uh, hopefully the name speaks for itself, but we have to just keep moving our people in the right direction, even in these dark times. So, or especially in these dark times. So thank you for this opportunity. And uh, Joel, fan of yours, look forward to hopefully 
um, having a conversation with you in the days ahead, either in person or if it's in this context uh, remotely. I appreciate the heck out of you guys. Be oh, safe absolutely. out. Love I'd love it. to come on the show and contribute nothing because I, you guys are way smarter. Love, so, love, uh, love you, love you, Andrew. <laughs> Run for and, mayor. Run for mayor. And, Run for mayor of the city. <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> Andrew, sorry, sorry. I don't Andrew know. Andrew Yang, everybody. Yeah. Sir Andrew. Andrew Yang. I just knighted him. Thank you, Andrew. Love you. Way too.